today we'll be speaking with a man who in his early 20s co-founded Dig and then went on to become a prolific investor in the most successful dot-com companies of today. He's also a watch lover. His name is Kevin Rose and today we're talking watches. Kevin, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Obviously, most people know you from, from your dig days and things like that. So what are you doing now exactly? Yeah, so I do a whole slew of different things, but I've been doing you know, a lot of in investing, first on the angel side, um, and then later for Google Ventures. Blue Bottle Coffee, where we're at, is one of my investments through Google Ventures. It's just a business that was started in the Bay Area. I met with the founder. He's got such a great vision for like roasting beans locally, getting them as quickly as possible to the shop, and really sourcing really high quality stuff. And I think that plays into a lot of the things that I'm passionate about, and of course, as any proper geek, like I have to have my fix of coffee in the morning. For sure. So if you could, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in watches in the first place. Oh gosh, so I have a, a kind of a strange story in that I was never into watches. I, I had some watches as a, as a kid, yep. you know, those watches, the little protectors and For all sure. that stuff. And so I, I wore watches as a child and then growing up, I became into computers. I got into computers and became an engineer, studied computer science. And so watches just kind of like, especially when the iPhone came out and other things, like I didn't need to have the time on my wrist. Yep. And so, it's a horrible story, but my, my father passed away. And one of the things I remember about my dad is that every night when he'd get home from work, he would always polish his Rolex. He was able to afford one Rolex, and, and that was like his watch. He was very proud of that watch. And I didn't really think much of it other than I remember my dad telling me just like, don't sell this watch, like, keep this watch. So this is actually my dad's Rolex that he left me with. You know, it's a very special piece to me. And then as I started doing that and started wearing that watch, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So I started reading more about watches and then my engineering brain took over. Yeah. And I didn't buy any watches yet and I just started doing research. Yeah. Started reading sites like yours. Yeah. Started just like understanding that it's not just about the bling of a watch or like the look of a watch. For me, it was like understanding the effort and time and engineering that went into all the movements, mm -hmm. you know? And so that got me really excited. I'm like, well, I, I can understand that. I used to build computers from scratch, all that. And then I saw Elongate, like the back of Elongate, and like looking at that and just being like, oh my God. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a little city. Yeah. This is so cool. Definitely. So then I started just slowly buying little pieces that I would really enjoy, that I had a visual attraction to, mm -hmm. but stuff that I wouldn't care if it got banged around and, and things like that. The first one is this Panerai here, the radio mirror, the eight day reserve. Mm -hmm. I really like the fact that you can forget about it for a few days yeah. and you can just come back to it and it's still running, you know, you don't have to worry about it. The ceramic housing on this, and actually I gotta tell you, it's worked quite well. I've hit my arm up against doorknobs, I, you know, banged it around and I still, I mean, it looks brand new. So that was my first kind of purchase. And then I started just kind of like, I don't know why it is, but Longa would just kind of pulled me in as a brand. It is the backs, you know, of them. I mean, if you take a look at the back of this uh, 1815 moon phase right here, it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful movement. And then on the balance cock, like I got to meet the people to do all the hand engraving there. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because when you take your watch in there to the factory, you get to sit down and see like the four people doing the engraving yep. and they'll take your watch, put it underneath the little microscope there and tell you which person did it. Yep. There was a guy on our tour, he's like, oh, here's my watch. They flipped it over and she's like, oh yeah, I'm the one that did that one. And it's just <laughs> like, it's so nuts, yeah. you know? So personal. Yeah, so personal. You get to meet like the, the artist that's doing all this stuff and it's just, um, it was really awesome. So, you know, there's, there's two pieces of this that I see. Like one is, you're a collector because you love the look and feel of something and you want to go out and buy and own it. And the other piece of it is like, I look at it as, you know, I'm an investor uh, professionally and I look at it as diversifying a little bit of my asset class in, in some way. Yep. And so some of these pieces that I've purchased are ones that I hope to keep forever, but are also an investment at the same time. And it's trying to figure that out at the same time. That's yep. really a fun game to do as well. Anyway, I love the 1815. Mm -hmm. it, you, you have one as well, I believe. I like, do, I have the chronograph. In my opinion, you know, and I'm going to echo something that Philippe Dufour has said in the past, but it is truly the best chronograph ever made. It's yeah. sensational. And this is kind of like a sister or brother to, to that chronograph. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this one here, the 1815 with the moon phase, it's, it's pretty hard to find. It is. You know, that's the other piece of this too, the hunt. The hunt that's is what just, it's all about. It's, it's like it's half of the, the game. 
So a couple other things here. Obviously, Patek is like, it's a brand that I feel like every collector has to have a piece or two. Definitely. I mean, the 5970, I've been eyeing that bad boy. <laughs> It's almost, we've said it before, it's almost the official watch of talking watches because almost every single person that we've interviewed, yourself included, just says, this is it. This is the ultimate, you know, perfect proportions, perfect movement, perfect everything. And on top of that, you know, you've mentioned before, it's about wearability, but it's also about investment. You can wear it every day, it's meant to be worn. However, you know, in 50 years, it will be worth more, and I guarantee it. And right. I think everybody would agree with that. I'm curious your take on, like, it's hard to find in the price point today, and this is part of the hunt, and part of, like, the, the kind of guessing game, like, where do you find that entry-level collectible watch? Yeah. Like, you know, this watch here, the System 51, I, it's a $150 watch. Yep. You know, I have two of them unopened yep. that I bought, and I just threw in the vault, just in case. You never know. You never know. You know, the, the, the most obvious answer would be vintage Rolex. Vintage Rolex sports watches for, you know, five to $10,000 are amazing watches. They look fantastic. But you don't think there's a bubble there at all, though? You People know, I, talk about a I, bubble. I, I think on, on the Paul Newman, on the $150,000 stainless steel watch for the Valjoux, you know, 72, I think there is a bubble. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, for a, an Explorer or a $5,000 Submariner or something like that, these watches are handmade, hand finished. They were made before Rolex was about luxury at all. It was about producing tools. You know, mm -hmm. if you were a diver and you were going 200 meters into the ocean, you didn't buy a Rolex because you thought it was badass or cool. Like you, you wore it because it worked. And right. That's it. You know. Right. And when you look at, at Rolex and Omega and some of the, and even you know Hoyer back then, you really start to appreciate the way that things were made back then relative to the way that things are, are made now. And I, I'm a vintage guy, obviously, but when you look at a 1960s or 1970s Submariner, you know you see the quintessence of beautifully made design. Everything was functional. It looks good today. It looks better today than right. the modern pieces. That's what I love about vintage stuff is like, and, and where I plan to kind of go in the future is get more into the vintage side. It's mm -hmm. just like the dings, everything's a part of the history of the yep. person that wore it. And, yep. and I think that's a really special thing. What else is there out there? What are you dying to own someday? Some of the stuff I think is just not released yet. I think for me, it's, it's kind of just like waiting for the next wave of things to whatever come. Whatever it is. Yeah, whatever it may be. Some of the stuff that um, on the Rolex side is, is kind of like I'm curious about. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, you know what I should mention? F.B. Jorn. I'm, I'm F.B. Curious. Like, I'm just kind of, I'm like, that is a cool brand. It is, it it's is. It's very unique and very low limited production. Yeah. And that's one where I'm just like really excited to actually get my hands and, and play around with a few of the pieces. So this Patek here is the first regulator, you know, that they've made. This is actually a really beautiful piece, micro rotor. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. You're a fan of this one as well. I, I love this watch. I mean, this watch is so not Patek at all. Mm -hmm. You know, regulator, kind of a slate gray dial with blue all over, blue strap. Right. It's so not them that I just absolutely love it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, really a focus on chronometry. And it's, it's really a very modern watch, but super thin, very wearable. I love the, the 240 base movement. The regulator takes a little time to kind of like get used to, to, to read the time, but like you said, it's just a beautiful piece. So this is something that when I'm still eyeing the 5970, I'm like, well, this could be my gateway drug into <laughs> eventually someday being able to own that. So yeah, that's, that's a great one. This, uh, this one here, it's done by a designer. The, the hands never cross each other. Mm -hmm. It's just absolutely beautiful, very casual. And this is like totally under the radar. It is. Like you wear this and no one even knows what it is. It's just a fun watch. It is. You know, like I've, I've always said that like if Apple were to design mm -hmm. a mechanical watch, this right. is what it would look like. That's probably why I got it. <laughs> I didn't know that until you just said that, but subconsciously that's probably yeah. why I got it. I mean, it, it's truly different. There's nothing else like it and there never will be anything else like it unless somebody copies this. Yeah. You know? And it's just cool stuff. I mean, it kind of goes with, with kind of like the, the Silicon Valley vibe, I would say. Oh, for you know? sure. For sure. This watch, we'll get into this one next. Like, yeah. this is one that I would never wear outside. It's a collectible piece. I, I would wear it, you know, once or twice a year to a really nice event. Yeah. You know, the site work for me, it's such a great, almost digital type feel. Longa has got to, like, send you a free t-shirt or something because, like, <laughs> I was reading your blog and, and you said if you're going to own any Longa, it'd be the Datagraph, and yeah. then if it's your second Longa, you'd be the site work. Yeah. And so I fell in love with the site work. And I have been on the hunt. I found the Luminos, which is an unbelievable piece. And then this one here, which was limited to 30, 30 pieces, pieces at, yeah. 30 total pieces. Beautiful, beautiful watch. No, I think, you know, kind of related to this, something that I've always felt is that it was almost kind of an adversarial relationship between kind of technology, modern technology that, that you kind of embody in some way, and this, which is the ultimate in traditional technology. Mm -hmm. Are tech guys into mechanical watches? If yes, why? If no, why? Some of them are starting to get into it. You know, obviously there's a lot of talk about the Apple Watch. Sure. The Apple Watch for me is going to be interesting. I'm, I'm certainly going to own one. Yeah. And I think that having notifications on my wrist, 
and email on my wrist, none of that excites me. I have that in my pocket. Yeah. That's just like taking it from my pocket and transporting it to my wrist, which is more interference, more noise, more division of my already like crazy, all over the place brain. But what's interesting for the Apple Watch and digital watches in general going forward is the sensors that they're putting into them. When you get real-time heart rate forever, you get, you know, all these different things. Imagine that this is like version one, yeah. and then think, extrapolate that out 10 years from now and say, what will this device be able to read about how my body is doing, yeah. right? And that's where it gets really interesting because it's more of a health device at that point. Can it detect uh, irregular heartbeats? Can it do certain things that, you know, glucose levels, whatever it may be uh, for diabetics? So I'm excited for that version of where these wearable devices go. Now, this isn't about that world for me. What this is about is a respect for engineering. Mm. Because when you meet these engineers, these watchmakers, you realize we're the same. Like really awesome coders, they call it like poetry and they try and condense it down into the least amount of steps and they get the most efficient code. Can you make the computer do something in you know, 20 lines of code versus 30 lines of code? Like make it even better, and refining it over time and getting right. it to run and execute even faster and if you think about what watch engineering is, it's a lot of that. It's about how can we refine this engineering even further, take it one step further than it was before, you know? And I have a respect for that. That's what gets me excited about this kind of stuff.